So if you did not know this from last week, you probably caught on to it this week, that Pastor Nick really loves the Olympics. Uh, like, I kid you not, like, the Olympics is one of those things where I will spend hours and hours and hours at night just watching and watching. Now, the cool thing about this year is it is in Tokyo, so we're always behind, right? Like, we're not I'm never streaming live events. We're always catching up and watching the recaps. But if you're a big nerd like I am, like, I'll check on who won events. Like, in the middle of the morning, I wake up, like, I wonder who won this, I wonder who won that. Because the Olympics to me is just so much more than just any regular sporting event. Like, you know, some of you really get in to football, and some of you have been riding Dallas thinking they're going to win a you know, uh, championship for a long time, and they haven't done nothing. Uh, you know, and you think about all these other teams, some of you are like, I am your Kentucky basketball fans, and every year we're like, we're going to win, we're going to win, and we don't. Uh, and then some of you are just need to get saved, you're Louisville fans, amen. And then we have just all these different things, but the Olympics to me is just the epitome of what it means to be an athlete. Exactly. Like, I mean, when you watch that, you're watching the best of the best of the best competing in their fields. And I don't know about you, but I, I, said, I really think the fittest people on the planet are those male gymnasts. Uh, can we just say, like, I kid you not, just to watch those guys in those rings, and, and, and your husband's probably sitting there, I could do that. Uh, you know what I mean? But all the while, like, you watch those guys, like, how? And then even the ladies, like, you watch some of them do things, I'm like, how? can they do that? Amen. And so sure enough, though, the Olympics touches me in a different way. Why? Because I know it's something that's been around for thousands of years. Like, there's a rich history of the Olympic Games. Now, when we say the games nowadays, you know, we're talking about the modern games. Now, the modern games started in 1896. 1896, a Frenchman, a Frenchman came back and said, hey, we should really start the games again. After he'd went and visited Olympia, uh, Olympia he had gone back and seen the historical sites and said, we should reinvigorate the games. We should bring it back, right? So sure enough, it was a throwback. Because the Olympics have been around a long time. Because before even Christ came and was born, the Olympics were operating. They were operating for, for, for hundreds of you know for hundreds of years they've been operating and operating. And back in the day, the very first events they had were just foot races. About 192 meters, they would just have foot races and they would determine who was going to be the Olympic champion. And as the games evolved, guess what? They started adding, adding in different things. And I don't know about you, some of you might really think MMA is where it's at. Back in the day, they used to have wrestling and fist fighting with no rules. That's my kind of Olympics, right? I uh, kid you not. Like, they used to have that back in ancient Greece. That's the way it was at some events. They would have wrestling. Like I said, they would have all these different events. And then it expanded and expanded and expanded to eventually in around 67 AD, Rome had eventually taken over the known world. Rome had came in and the Roman Empire had conquered everyone in the known world, so to speak. They conquered uh, Israel. They conquered uh, the, the Greeks. They conquered everyone. And when they came in, the games lost its lustrous appeal. To the point, like I said, at 67 AD, the Emperor Nero rode in the chariot races, and he flipped his chariot, and he still declared himself the winner. <laughs> he still did, so the games lost their luster, and they eventually died not long after that. So for roughly well over a thousand years, there was no games that were held. There was no competing that was done. Until, like I said, in 1896, the games got reinvented. And now we see the symbols of the five rings. I guarantee you, can anybody tell me from the crowd, raise your hand if you know what the five rings stand for. Anybody know? Look at that. Look at, isn't that amazing that we watch an event every four years and we see this, the five interlocking rings? And they, they have tattoos of it, right? Emily said, if I want, I'd have a big tattoo. Uh, you know, she said, if I want a little bit going, I'd have a big tattoo too. Because it's pretty special, right? And think about that. But the rings represent continents. So the Americans, the Americas are one ring. And then you have Africa, Asia, Europe, and Australia. That's the five things. Now, some of you are very familiar with geography. You're thinking, that's not all of them. Uh, but once again, this has been around for about 100 years. They've been showing the same symbol because that's what they know it as. So this is a huge part of our culture. Huge part of our culture by itself. We have mad respect when we see somebody competing and winning. <laughs> like, I would even argue that it's part of our very DNA as com just competitors that we love to compete. Especially if you're a male, amen? Like, you love to compete and to win. And to think about that, we're reading this book of Hebrews, 
We're reading there in chapter 12. We're reading about how he says, the author says, that we should run this race. That there's a race that's set before us and we should run it with endurance. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. To think about, he's probably referencing the Olympic Games itself here in this chapter. And here we are in 2021 and we have that same reference to pull off of. Isn't that amazing? Amen. To think about the beauty of that, because this book, that, that letter to the Hebrews was written around 67 AD to 68 AD. Think about the span of that, that the Word of God was just as current back then than it is today. Isn't that amazing, church? Amen. You know what I'm man? We need a more relevant word. Talk about a relevant word. That probably the author is referencing the same type of events we would be seeing on our televisions is the same type of events he's probably referencing to these people about runners, about competing for a championship, about competing for the prize. And he takes that and switches it to talk about we should run the race. We should run the race. Now, when I hear run the race, you automatically read that in verse number one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. One of the biggest problems when you know a lot about the Bible, one of the biggest problems when you've studied the Bible for your entire life, one of the biggest problems when you have some education in the Bible is when you hear somebody preach about the Bible and they preach it wrong, it hurts you. And many people preach this verse wrong. Because here's the thing I wanted to get off with on the right foot, okay? When it says we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, many people take that verse out of context and they run to think that Moses and Elijah and Samson and all the saints of old are looking down at us, watching us run for God. Many people take that verse and they run with it even to funeral homes and they'll say, well, that's my guardian angel. My loved one is watching over me. Let me say this to you as clear as day, based on the word of God. You don't have guardian angels that are loved ones that are watching over you. That's nowhere to be found in Scripture. That's nowhere to be found in the Word of God. And to think that they gained their wings, that's not the truth. So when he says there that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, there's two meanings that can imply. The most popular is that one, witnesses. As in people that witness a sporting event, spectators, bystanders, people that look on while others compete. Kind of like many people went to watch Garth Brooks look on, amen, last night in Nashville, and they got rained out. That's a thunder roll. Uh, why? Because they were witnessing. Some 60,000 people went down there to witness Mr. Brooks put on a concert. They were witnessing. And then you think of the other way, which I firmly believe, this is how the author intended to be, when someone witnesses, they testify what they've seen and heard. Amen. That's the only two types of witnesses you have there. Someone who's witnessing a sporting event, a bystander, someone who watches it. And then the other one is like a legal type term, which is someone who testifies about what they have seen and heard. So when it says here we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have to remember context. You know the three most important things about real estate? Location, 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 right? You know the first three things about the Bible? Context, context, context. Amen. Because it cannot mean for us, look at me church, this is going to get many of you in trouble. It cannot mean for us what it did not mean for them. Amen. It cannot mean for us what it did not mean for them. The most dangerous words uttered in churches today is, well, to me, it says this. I don't care what to me you think it sounds like. It's what does God mean it to say? Amen. What does God mean it to say? Because once again, it cannot mean for us what it did not mean for them. Do you remember the, the past couple weeks I've showed you some big things? So the beginning of this chapter, it says, therefore. If there is a therefore, it is there for a reason. If there is a therefore, it's there for a reason. So this is coming after chapter 11. I'm going to show you all something here. Mathematics, all right? 10, 11, 12. So back in the day, whenever he wrote this letter, he didn't, the author didn't write, chapter 1, thus number 1. And he didn't begin to type. He wrote a big, long, huge letter. Can you imagine getting this bad boy in your mailbox? We've got another letter, y'all! Can you imagine the Corinthians getting two letters from Paul that were thick? Big old long, needy letters? Amen. Paul sent us a word. They're probably thinking, I don't want to hear this word. 
So whenever we're reading this, and we read, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have to go back and think, what is the therefore following? The therefore is following chapter 11, which is called the Hall of Faith. If you ever want a brief synopsis, a brief summary of the Old Testament, read chapter 11. Amen. Chapter 11 walks you through all those major characters in the Old Testament and tells you what they were known for and how they had faith and persevered. How they had faith and they persevered. How they had faith and they overcame. It doesn't highlight what they did. Listen to this church. It highlights what God did through them. Amen. It doesn't highlight what they did. It highlights what God did through them. Because the hero of Scripture is not me and you. The hero of Scripture is Jesus. The hero of Scripture is God. In Genesis, it's God. You know who is in Revelation? It's God. So you have to get that. That's just the intro. Hi. Uh, all right, so let's pick up, and we'll keep going here, and let's see what really happens. So the, the witnesses here, let's look at our point number one. We have witnessed their running of the race. And their lives witness or testify about God. So we've witnessed their running of the race. The race is the race of faith. Guys, we all witness. Every time we read the Word of God, we are witnessing what God did in their lives and through their obedience. We are witnessing how their faith had legs. We are witnessing how their faith ran. We are witnessing how their faith stumbled. We are witnessing how their faith endured. We are witnessing how their faith was multiplied. We are witnessing what God did in them and through them for His glory and for their good. Amen. We're seeing all of that in the story of Scripture. You know why Pastor Nick's always like, guys, you've got to read it because this is our heritage. Amen. This is our ancestors. This is our foundation of the faith, guys. This is literally our people. This is who we come from. And so when it says there, that beautiful thing, like I said, we are witnessing them run the race, and they're testifying what God has done. I want to show you how much just a little bit of study time, how a little bit of cross-referencing can just unlock the Bible in a profound way for any of you guys. Because here's the thing. I'm not a biblical expert. You're not either. But guess what? This book is so amazingly awesome and complex that you can pull things out and connect them and then make your mind blow. And I'm going to show it to you very quickly here because look what it does here. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Once again, we're going back. Uh, verse number 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of a place and he was received as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. We know that, right? We stood that last fall. And by faith, he went out to live in the land of promise as a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob heirs with him at the same promise. For he was looking forward to that city that had its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And chapter 11, verse number 11, By faith Sarah her, herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she was considered the faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sands by the seashore. So once again, guys, the author there in chapter 11 in those verses is taking us all the way back to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis chapter 12 and reminding us about who Abraham is. Father Abraham, right, had many sons. Uh, you know, we hear that over and over again, but he's dragging these people back to their ancestor and saying, you remember Abraham? Abraham lived by faith. Abraham left his whole family, left his pagan, pagan worshiping family. And God called him out to do an extraordinary thing, which was become the very man who God would base his entire nation off of. Amen. That's why I call him Father Abraham. Because you ask a, a person who's practicing Judaism today about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he takes them all the way back to that first chain link and says, Abraham. Let's talk about Abraham. He did all this by faith. And then he brought up Sarah. Sarah had faith in the one who promised. Even though her body was as good as dead, she had faith in the one who promised. Amen. So what is Paul going to do here? Let's look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Once again, I'll hopefully show you how just a little bit of study work shows some big things here. Galatians chapter uh, 3, verse 7. Know that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And that the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So this is pretty mind-blowing, church. Think about this. 
We think of the gospel as the life, the burial, I mean the life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, right? So here Paul is saying God preached the gospel to Abraham before Christ ever showed up on the scene in Matthew chapter 1. I mean, before the genealogy of Christ was ever drafted, God already had a plan. Peter would say like this, before the foundation of the world was laid, Jesus was already destined to die. That's how far our God's looking ahead. And we worry about tomorrow when God's already been there, amen? Because guys, what you don't understand about our God is God is outside the realm of time. He is completely sovereign over everything. Amen. He's completely beyond. He dwells in eternity. You know what that means? There's no time there. So here when he says that he preached the gospel to Abraham, He's showing us that, guess what? God's always had a plan for me and you. God's always had a plan for us to be grafted into his grand story. Look what it says here. Saying, in you, verse number 8 there, shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham and the man of faith. So you know how God chooses to bless the nations? You know what God's chief goal and how he ultimately blesses us? is in Christ. So when he makes that promise all the way back in Genesis 12, through you and your offspring, I will bless the nations. Through you, I will bless the whole entire world. Guys, that nations and everyone else, you know what that should make you perk up? That's us. Unless you're a first century Jew or unless you can track your, your bloodline all the way back to pure Judaism, amen, you're a Gentile. So when he says there that we've all been blessed, we've all been blessed in Christ. That's why Christ is such a big deal, guys. Because without Jesus, we have no link to God. Amen. I want you to understand that. There is no priest that can link you with God other than the great high priest who cannot die. There is no water that can bring you into God's relationship. Why? Because, once again, it's not water that makes the way. It's the precious blood of the Lamb of God who is Jesus that makes the way. Amen. That's why Jesus is such a big deal. Why? Because He brings us into relationship with God. He truly does. So think about that. And let's, let's, let's clarify this even more. He builds on this in verse number 10 in Galatians. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse... For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of law and do them. So the law ain't going to get you there. So you think for the Jews, they think all the while, you know, it's got to keep the law, got to keep the law. Maybe for some of us in the church, we grew up in a legalistic church that taught us it's you have to do before you can earn. Let me tell you something, that's not the gospel. The gospel says it was done so that you could receive. Amen. That's what the grace says. Grace says you don't have to do, it's finished. That doesn't make you feel great, church, knowing that it's not about our race that counts. It's about the race that's already been run that counts. Amen. Think about that. Look what it says here. Now it's evident that though no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And, but the law is not a faith, rather the one who does not live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, as is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ, Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Amen. In Genesis 12, God knew about Calvary Baptist Church. God knew about me and you, and he already said, oh, I've made a way. Amen. I've made a way. Whenever the serpent twisted and stole and literally brought sin into the domain of the world. Whenever that happened, guess what? The Word of God tells us. He looked down at that serpent and said, One will come and he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Guys, that's, that's talking about Jesus. Amen. Let us make man in our image. That's the Trinity. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see Jesus on every page in Scripture. The saddest thing about most churches and most people who grew up in church or in lives, they think Jesus shows up in Bethlehem wrapped in the arms of a virgin. 
when they don't understand that Jesus was on the very first page of the Word of God. Amen. In the garden, from the garden looking up, it's looking to the cross. Always looking to the cross. All the way till you get to the, the resurrection. And guess what, guys? You know what me and you do? Me and all of us, we look back at the resurrection. They were looking forward, we're looking back. Amen. Think about the gravity of that. So here's the thing. The big thing I want you to get from this is number point number two. Our God is on a mission. Our God's on a mission. And you might say, why does it say not our God is on a mission? I just did it a while ago, right? That'd be the correct grammar. But God is on a mission. He's not on a mission. He's on mission. You know what that means is God is the one who's always seeking after us. Amen. God's on mission. No one comes to the Father, you know, it was through me. And we know what the Word of God says. The Spirit Himself even draws them. You cannot come to God on your own terms. Amen. I want you to get that. You have to come to God on His terms. And God's Spirit is wooing you. I love that verse in Hosea. I will, I will whisper tenderly to you in the wilderness. It's God wooing us to Himself. It's God's goodness and mercy and grace that draws us to Him. It's not me and my righteousness that draws me. It's my wickedness that sends me away from Him. But God's on mission to seek and save those who are lost. God's on mission. That's what you see in Abraham's story. That's what you see in every page of Scripture. That's what you see in every, every quote is God on mission. God looking to seek and to save those who are lost. God on mission. Everywhere it goes, God's on mission. God's on mission. God's on mission. Because our God is moving and active. He's on mission. Aren't you praising the Lord? He's not a lazy God. Amen? I'm glad I don't have God who's sitting back in a lazy boy. They'll figure it out. <laughs> Maybe I'll eat. I'm glad I don't have a God who's not concerned about the very details of my lives, of our lives. Let me tell you something. You think, well, God, God, really, you know, God's got too many things going on. Let me tell you something. God picked the color of your eyeballs. Amen. Let that sink in for a minute, church. God picked the very flakes of color that make up your daggum retinas. Around your retina. I don't even know if it's retina, maybe. It's somewhere in there. <laughs> God pulled out your hair color. When you're in the womb, the Word of God says He formed you in the very secrets of your mother's womb. And you tell me God don't care about the details of your lives? He's that small in detail, but He's also grand and architectural enough that He can, guess what, plan the very foundations of the world. Because our God is infinitely sovereign and big, but He's also very personal that everybody in this room can, can have. Listen to me carefully here. Can have a personal relationship with Him. Amen. Brother Nick, that don't make sense to me. It don't to me either. <laughs> how, how is that possible? I don't know. I just know because the Bible tells me so. Amen. Amen. A lot of truth in that old kid song. Because the Bible tells me so. And God is not only on a mission, but he calls us to be on a mission with him. When Jesus leaves the disciples, he there in Matthew 28, um, verse number 16 says, Now the eleven disciples came to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. You ever know, you want to call it a memory verse, a verse for your life? Maybe it's verse number 17, but some doubt it. They had just seen the resurrection. Some of them were worshipping. Yay, Jesus is alive. Then it says, some of them doubt I can relate to that, amen. Amen. Let me tell y'all something. Some of y'all think, man, Pastor Nick's always full of faith. Hit me on a bread truck Monday, amen. <laughs> you know why pastors call Mondays bread truck Mondays? Because everybody loves a bread man. He's always happy. He shows up bunny bread, right? He's always rolling in hot. Everybody loves bread. But sometimes I get down in my dumps. I think, God, do you really know what you're doing? Sometimes I have lack of faith. Like, God, are you going to take care of this? God, are you going to take care of that? Sometimes I go looking for answers. Because let me tell you this, I say this over and over again to you every week because I want you to get this church. There's nobody in this building who's got it all together. There's nobody here who's got unshakable faith, unwavering faith. They never, ever have doubts. Let me tell you something, you've all, we've all had doubts. Amen. But he who's always risen to the occasion and overcame those doubts is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's always done, like Ephesians tells, above and exceedingly more. He'll get asked for a thing. That's just how God works. I worried for a long time. I don't think I'm going to get married. God does abundantly more than you could ask or think. Amen. Amen. He does. You worry and you're concerned all the time. I don't know if God's going to do it. 
You go back and you look at these witnesses. You go back and read their testimonies. You go back and listen to them testify about what God did for them. Some of you, you know why most of us are depressed? Because we don't read the Word of God. No, why? Because we'll see that they were depressed. But guess what? They did not run away from God with their answers. I mean, with their doubts. They ran to God with their doubts. That's the big difference in a Christian, guys. We've got to run to God with our doubts. Not run away from Not hide in shame and lack of faith. We've got to run to the Lord. Say, God, I need you to help my faith. Help my unbelief. You ever read a story of the Word of God think that's me? When that brother comes to Jesus and he says, I need you to heal. I think it's his daughter. And he says, I can do it. He says, I need you to help my unbelief. Dude, that's me. Amen. God, help my unbelief. God, help me. Help me do it. Point number three, he commands us to join him on his mission. He commands it. It's a great commission. I need to get there, man. I'm so excited. Uh, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He commands us to go on mission with him. You know what I love about that? He doesn't send us by ourselves. He says, I'm going to be with you. You might be thinking, I don't know what God wants me to do. You know what the will of God is? Matthew 28. So you might be thinking, I just wish God would tell me what to do. Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them and teaching them. Because that's our, that's our goal. We exist for that purpose. You might be thinking, I wish I just knew what our church was about. That's what we're about. That's the race. There it is, right there in the words of red themselves. We are called. We are commanded to go and make disciples. Amen. We are commanded to go out and baptize and to teach them. And let me tell you something. Let me, here's a big mess up in church. We get in trouble all the time over this. Baptism in the water is not the end of our faith. It's the start of our faith. It is the starting line of the race. When somebody comes up and says, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided that I want to be saved. I've cried out to the Lord. I've admitted I was a sinner. I've confessed my sins. I've repented of my sins. I've turned my back on the world. I've turned to Christ. When somebody does that, they are, they're at the starting line, amen. And they're there and they're ready to run. And the worst thing possible in the church today is we pat them on the back saying, you've already won. When the fact of the matter is they haven't been trained. They haven't been discipled. Well, the fact of the matter is we've sabotaged them for the world and the ministry of the world and we've put them on track for destruction in the very workplace they go in because we've just gave them a bath. We've never made disciples. Amen. And you get this world that we have today in the church and outside the church. It's the same people. Same people. Why? Because we didn't disciple people. We didn't show them how to run the race. We gave them a new pair of cleats. Said, good luck running. And we didn't show them. You know what I've learned in my life, just my short, short 30 years of life? Is it's not the ones who run well that, that give me the most joy. It's the ones that I didn't show how to run that robbed me the most joy. Amen. Because I feel the weight of it. I felt the way the ones who I did not do the right thing with. And I sabotaged them. Before they even started, I sabotaged them. And I want you to get this, church. The, that, that, that baptism, it's that starting line. So when you see somebody go in, let me tell you some people hoop and holler. Woo, praise God. You know, they're clapping. We ought to get excited about that. Don't get me wrong. But you know what to make us more excited? In five years, they're still coming. In 10 years, guess what? They got little babies with them. Cussing in the parking lot, but coming in. I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm here. I'm running the race. <laughs> that would make us excited, church. Amen. Because let me tell you something. It is a grueling marathon. Amen. It's not a sprint. It's a grueling marathon. We're going to get on that. I'm going to hit on that hard. Because it's a grueling race. 
It's a grueling marathon of a life. It's not an over and done. It's not a one and done. It's not get baptized, you're done. Here's your get out of hell free card. That's not the church of the New Testament. It's are you running? Are you running the race? Because you know I know, here's the big thing, here's the big take I want you to get from this. Is mission precedes worship. Mission precedes worship. You might be like, whoa, 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 whoa. That makes no sense. It makes perfect sense. You only worship the Lord because of the great things he has done. Would you agree with that? Amen. You worship the Lord. Why? Because of the great things he has done done. It's his greatness that we worship. It's his glory that we behold. It's his holiness that draws us to him because he's so different than us. It's those reasons that mission proceeds our worship. You know how I, I can tell you I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt when someone's not worshiping the Lord, it's because they don't understand his mission. They do not understand the gospel if they have a problem with worship. And I'll prove it to you. Why? Because they don't really understand who they're singing about. Because if we really understood who we were singing about, we would sing loud and proud. We would have tears in our eyes every time we sing, Yet not I, but Christ in me. We would sing that because we know how much we struggle. Like we know how much our flesh twist inside of us. We know the sin of destruction in our lives. And so when we sing, yet not I, but Christ in me, I sing that with everything I got because that's all I've got, church. So we sing how great our God is. When we sing that classic hymn, you know, in Christ alone. I'm not saying it in Christ alone. I'm up here off key, baby. Why? Because I'm up here singing because I know nobody else can get me there. Right, it's in Christ alone. That's all I've got. But you might say, well, I, my, my worship's not what it needs to be. I would encourage you, go back and read the mission. Go back and see the testimony. Because as let me tell you something, you've got to say this because, you know, you get in trouble now. These people think you, you might be plagiarism. I mean, I heard John Piper say this in the sermon. I was getting ready for this, and it was just so good. I mean, I'm stealing it for John Piper. I mean, God forgive me. I'm borrowing it, amen. But he said this, and I was just like, man, that's true. It's so true. Guys, we're running this race. We're running through this course of life. You know what? We should read the Word of God. You know why we should? Because when I struggle and fail, when I get depressed, I ought to read Elijah. I ought to go back and read about Elijah and his depression. And I ought to read what he, the Lord, what, what, what he went through. And let me tell you something. Elijah, in the Word of God, testifies to me. He's faithful. Amen. Brother, he'll get you through the dark night. You might be thinking, man, I've lost a child. You've got no idea what I've been through. You ought to go back and read what David says. He's faithful. I found him to be faithful. You might think, you don't understand my situation, Pastor Nick. I'm telling you, there is somebody in this book who had your situation. Amen. I'm telling you, there's somebody in this book who went, thing, went through something far worse than you and I have been through. You might think, man, I, Pastor Nick, you don't understand, I'm in the fire. Thank God there's somebody else in there with you. Amen. Tell that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and me and baby names. <laughs> Tell that to them old boys. Well, you don't understand, my work's difficult. There's another in there. Amen. Man, you might think, man, I, you don't understand, I ain't got nobody. Tell that to the very Son of God, who when they crucified him didn't have nobody. We've got people, guys, that we can go back and relate to. If they could tell you anything, they would tell you, boy, keep running. Just keep running. Just keep running. In our bedroom, in our house, it looks really good. Let me tell you something. My wife came in, she made her little nest, amen. <laughs> Everything in our house got F on it, amen. F on the pillow. F on the bedspread, F on towels, amen. My last name, amen. Got F's everywhere. Looks real good. Monogram, looks all nice. We've got matching furniture. I've never had some of that. Some of it doesn't match, amen, but it looks good. <laughs> it was all free. I ain't kidding you. 
But if you look in our bedroom, we've got two things that are just out of place. Two things you're like, oh, all right, well, okay. <laughs> you probably came in, you're probably thinking, that just looks ugly. We've got a sign by our door. You've probably seen me post on Facebook before. It's, it's jacked up in color and it looked real great, but it says, give grace. So every morning I go to work, I read that sign, I say, give grace. Every morning in my head, I see it every day of morning when I walk out that door, dressed in my work clothes, give grace. It reminds me every day. And every night before I go to bed, you know, the last things I look at besides my beautiful wife is on her side of the bed, there's a poster that's ugly as sin, amen? It's black, it's old, it's dirty, it's got cobwebs probably somewhere in it. And you know what it's a picture of? It's a picture of a runner. You think I'm lying to you. I've got a picture on my phone. I'll show you. I wish I would load it in. I'm going to later in the sermon series. And it's just a picture of a runner running. He's got some stuff behind him. So every night when I go to bed, I think, man, I'm going to quit tomorrow. I might quit tonight. I see that runner. I think, oh, no, we've got to keep running, baby. When my friends desert me, guess what? i got to look at that runner and say, oh, we're going to keep running, baby. When me and Emily go to bed fighting, guess what? I'm going to look at that runner and say, I just got to keep running. Just got to keep running. Because let me tell you something, guys. It is a hard run. Amen. We've been called to run the race. Because we have a history of faith. We've got people who overcame, not through their own power, but through Christ in them. Romans says it like this, the same spirit that raised Christ up from the dead lives inside of you. Amen. You got to keep running. My marriage is on fumes. Let me tell you something, sister, brother. You keep running. These kids, I'm about to put them up for adoption, amen. You keep running. I'm about to quit this job. Let me tell you something. You don't quit that job, you get another job. You keep running. Because you're surrounded by people who have got through it. I'm surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. They testify God's faithful. They testify you can finish the race. You know what I love most encouraging about that? They didn't receive what was promised. So the Bible says they didn't receive what was promised yet. Let me tell you something, though. I know God's going to give us what's promised someday. One of the happiest days of all eternity is when I, when I see when I see death, hell, and the grave be thrown into that lake, when I see sin itself shoved in that lake, and I see our King of glory standing, I'm victorious. When death, hell, and the grave has been demolished for all eternity, then we'll sing the loudest we've ever sung. Because on that day, the race will be over. On that day, we'll get what was promised to us. On that day, We'll all worship because the mission will have been accomplished. Amen. But until that day, church, you know what I'm asking you to do with me? I'm asking you to run. I can't run. Then you walk fast. <laughs> I can't walk fast. Then you hobble quick. I can't hobble quick. You keep crawling. But you do not stop. Because we have to run the race. Won't you come run? Won't you come run? I'm asking every head to bow, right at close. Nobody looking around. Every head to bow, right at close.